topics related to something we call the light approach. And then I will be handing off to my uh, dear colleague uh, and professor and uh, uh, teacher in, in many ways, uh, Professor Regina, which you all know and love. And uh, let me just take you through what I'm going to be covering. Um, we have, uh, I have nearly 30 minutes or less. So I'm gonna just quickly discuss the challenge uh, leading to the, to the light framework. Try to explain the light framework in less than 20 minutes, which is, I'm gonna give myself a big cake if, if it works. And uh, then some extension efforts afterwards. So first, you know, what's, what's the challenge? Why, why do we need the, the light framework or any framework in, in this regard when it comes to, to information management? Now, there's, there's, there's many, many reasons. First, when we're dealing with information nowadays, we're really discussing digital by default. We're not discussing just any kind of information. And we're looking at how to manage a huge flow of, of information covering, uh, you know, uh, the design, the construction, the operation. Um, there's so many tools, new tools, there's so many new concepts, uh, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's blockchain, or whether it is IOTs, et cetera. It's a huge emerging field. And really there is no high level frameworks or, you know, frameworks that deal with all this complexity in, in one go or try, try to make sense of it. So, I mean, there's, of course, there's lots of good effort, and this is just one of them, to try to find a way to, to make this complex thing about information management in our industry a bit more understandable. And this is an attempt to deliver such a framework. Some of the things we know, some of the things we've used are, in many sense, in, in, in a sense, they're, they're not really future-proof. Many, many things have already, have been, been you know, generated lately, but still starting to show signs of aging already. Uh, so many of these things that we know and we use are, are not really future-proof. And how do we know, you know, how can we predict the future? We can see what, what's, hap what's happening in other industries that we typically, knowing or unknowingly we follow, we, 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 we learn from. There's many influences to light. I'll, I'll introduce what light uh, uh, means, but there's lots of, you know, theoretical you know, methods and standards and theories leading to light. You know, you know the top, top one would say uh, lean uh, in project delivery. Uh, there is a lot to learn and it's a lot to love. There's a lot to follow uh, in Lean. Um, Lean, of course, uh, you know, focuses on uh, production methods uh, applied to, to construction. Uh, it, one of the things that Lean does not cater for strongly is information management and especially digital information management. Uh, this concurrent engineering, uh, very in a strong theoretical backbone uh, across, a, 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 you know, more than one industry. But one of the issues with concurrent engineering with its strength is, is this, uh, what I refer to as stage decay. You know, I'm just going to quickly just, uh, you know, something quickly. We cannot really cover this in any detail. Like you could go from one stage to the next stage to the to the third stage, and then you lose the connection between these stages. If you go to the next one, you lose the connection with the stages, uh, you know, just two steps behind. Um, can learn a lot, uh, you know, massively from, from the agile and uh, scrum methodology and project management, especially in the software industry. But these, these ones are optimized for digital uh, outputs. They're not really optimized for uh, products, physical products. So we can learn a lot at the same time. They're not in on their own applicable. We could go on and on. We could look at the, the V model. We could, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn, but there's uh, some weaknesses in the V model when it comes to information uh, flow and with regards to measurement, horizontal measurement with it separates, so to give you an example, it separates between information actors and professional actors. Uh, in, in nowadays, really, all of us are information actors. All of us work in information. You cannot be 
uh, like a, a designer, an engineer, an architect, and not deal with information management. If you're dealing you know, with digital information, you have to be both. You have to be an information actor at the same time as being an architect, an engineer, a constructor, a facility manager. And of course, there is uh, the standards, uh, the suite of standards, uh, ISO 19650, a uh, very strong foundation uh, for our industry. Um, but also ISO has its uh, uh, limitations. It's uh, in, in, in some sense, it is very abstract. In other senses, it's very prescriptive. Yeah, also, it, in some senses, it confuses information management with the procurement models. Um, so there's lots of things to learn from all of these, uh, but you know, at least this is what we're claiming, that there is a space for a, a framework for information management, which is you know, built specifically to tackle um, supply ch uh, chain disintegration and try to help the supply chain to integrate by first integrating information flows. So there's lots of influence. This is not just the, the only influences leading to the uh, light framework and the light approach, and um, but these are the, the the main ones. And I would invite you to read the paper, which I'm going to be pointing to uh, shortly. So what is this light framework thing? There's a uh, lots of research leading to the to the light framework. You know the the main paper uh, covering it, our first paper with my colleague and friend uh, Eric Poirier, uh, associate professor at uh, uh, ETS. Uh, he's part of the the it's a, it's a group called Grid within uh, ETS. He's in Quebec in Canada. Uh, we published this uh, in April 2020. It covers uh, the light framework. Um, in general, you know, you, what you'll see today is, is all explained in that uh, journal paper. You will, there's, a, there's a link here, hopefully later you will, you'll be able to, uh, there's a recording, there would be some sharing of the slides. You can download this paper and have a, have a look uh, on your own. Hopefully you find it uh, useful. So the paper is called Lifecycle Information Transformation and Exchange. It's a very long title, I know, I'm trying to cover a lot. Uh, and it's intended for delivering and managing digital and physical assets. Now, it doesn't come out of nothing. There's a lot of work before it. There's going to be a lot of work uh, after it. But the idea of all these frameworks, and, and I've, I've uh, you know, personally worked on a number of them, is that you, they don't come like this. You know, yeah, there's so many, so many smaller conceptual uh, uh, items or components that need to be developed that lead to a framework. And this is just uh, something from my, my, my thesis uh, back in 2013. I you know, probably have the record for the longest uh, PhD thesis, uh, took nine years. Um, and uh, that how, how you connect um, terms, how to classifications, to taxonomies, to, you know, to conceptual models, and then you end up in framework. So, so leading up to the light framework, there's lots and lots of terminology that needed to be defined, clarified. There's lots of classifications, there's lots of taxonomies combining these classifications, lots of models leading uh, to the framework. And now, and, and, and the way this works is that these frameworks are not just intended to be read and understood or to be used in education. Uh, or to, to fuel more research, that the, the intention of these frameworks, and this definitely includes the one I'm going to be introducing today, is to produce practical tools. Uh, you know, if for me and, you know, for many researchers, a framework has value in its own, but will its value will, 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 will exponentially grow uh, if it can produce practical tools for, uh, you know, people to use in their, um, you know, in the, the way they, they prove how they work, to, to help them predict information flow, to help them, you know, at the bare minimum, to help them understand the world around them. So what is the life cycle information transformation and exchange approach? Um, there's a lot of terms, life cycle, information, transformation, exchange, uh, managing digital, physical, etc. So let's go through some of these uh, quickly. 
you know, when we say life cycle, there's a, this term, you know, could mean many things. It could mean project life cycle. Uh, it could mean asset life cycle, like how it goes through uh, from, from, you know, the cradle, uh, you know, from the initial idea of an asset till its demolition or reuse and about information life cycle. Uh, and, and information life cycle is the core uh, deliverable out of this framework about how the information you know, starts from the, from, the, from the conception through to the design and delivery of any kind of asset until its refurbishment and reuse. Information, you know, what is information? You could find, you know, tens of, of, of definitions, if not hundreds of, of definitions of information in, in ISO alone, in the international standard, uh, you know, uh, documentation, you will find, meaning when I first looked, it was 78, back in July 2018. And then I looked again, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back, and now there's another 10 definitions. So there's now nearly 88 definitions of ISO, including actually now five covering um, building and construction sectors. So really, there's lots of definitions. Not all of them are aligned. So really, the, the, the term information when used here is, is with discussing any, any facts provided or learned about events. So it's very general. Try to take as, as general a, approach to information as possible, but then limited to digital form of that information when we're discussing the, the flow of it, okay? So, but information, uh, you could, lots of definitions. We don't really need to worry too much about how to define it, except that when we're dealing with it through this framework, it must be in digital form. Now, when we start to apply some of the, the things that this new approach, the, the light approach introduces, it introduces the concept of information as being three things. One of three things, two of three things, all three things together as being the, just the manifestation of information. So when we say information, when we're dealing with information in our industry, we are dealing with information that looks to us like models, could look to us like uh, you know a document, a digital document, or could you know be data, data stream, a data set. So that, this this idea that information um, you, you know is is abstract, we need to define it in order to manage it. And the way the light framework defines it by saying it either appears to you, and it's very important, it's just how it appears to you. It could appear to you as a model. You could be looking at a 3D model on a screen, but it could embed lots of data. You could be looking at a document which has a 3D image in it, or you could have an interactive 3D PDF, etc. cetera, so you have a model within a document, or it could be just a data set. And now this, these are manifestations of information. And understanding information to be, you know, this combination of models and documents and data set, it's very important to help us um, define it. And as we define it, we can manage it. And as we manage it, we could integrate it. And this, this progression is a progression of maturity. If you're familiar with the, with the information and, or, and performance maturity uh, work, you know that for anything to be integrated, it needs to be first well-defined. You, you, you know, and then it needs to be managed and then it can be integrated. So back to the term information, I was saying, okay, so we have information as models and documents and data. We could now uh, look at how they're used. Uh, so how a document is used, how a model is used, how the data is used. You know, the, we could look at the view, you know, you know how, do I'm, I'm, how I'm interacting with, uh, with this information and view definition, how I'm defining that view what type of viewer I'm using and what kind of environment uh, really, which is the ecosystem of, 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 of uh, managing, exchanging, uh, integrating uh, information. Now, when we're discussing assets in the, in the light framework, it, it does not really uh, uh, differentiate uh, in, in a hard sense between physical and digital. This is something very important in the light framework and it separates it from other uh, frameworks. Uh, for example, we say 
you know, the physical asset could be a door, a handle, a column, a, it could be a pump, it could be anything. And there's a specific scale uh, that you can deal with assets. Uh, and you won't, you won't find this in the, in the manuscript itself, the published journal, but you can find it uh, online in the BIM framework uh, uh, blog. And it, under, it introduces a scale. And this is very important. Asset scale is, 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 is really uh, um, underappreciated in our discussion of asset life cycle. Because every time we try to discuss asset life cycle, people's thoughts go to buildings or like large structures. And tell them, hold on a second, meaning these assets are really portfolios of smaller assets. Okay, and that, these assets, the smaller assets are also like a combination of smaller assets. So when we're discussing asset management and asset life cycle, it's very important to keep this different, different scales in mind and try to understand the flow of information across the life cycle for all different scales of these assets. So there is a, a life cycle for a, for a, for a door handle, door handle, or door, or column. There's a life cycle for a pump. There's a life cycle for a, for a, for a mechanical system. There's a life cycle for the whole building, for a whole campus, you know, even for, for a site and a city, etc. cetera. And attending these scales allow, uh, allow us to, uh, you know, uh, allows us to understand how to manage them in a, in a, in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, and I won't be able to go into detail into these, how these scales apply across the framework, but I'm hoping when you read the manuscript, these things will come a little bit clearer. So when we're dealing with assets, it's always, you know, this interplay between physical and digital. Meaning what, what's physical and what's digital? Really nowadays it's becoming really ambiguous. You know, if you're putting a, a VR set uh, you know, what are you seeing? When you're looking, using augmented reality, what are you seeing? It's a combination of physical and digital. If you're, if you're a human, you, you may be able to touch it and, and, and feel the physicality of it. If you're, a, or if you're a, a machine actor, everything is digital for you. If you're a computer or a robot or an AI, everything is digital. There's no real physical uh, sense uh, there. Uh, so it's very important to cover this, this, this interplay between physical and digital, how they overlap. A door handle, a model of a door handle, a column, a document about a column, a, you know, a whole city or a 3D of a whole city. These are manifestations of how we interact with these assets. You could be interacting with it in a physical sense, interacting with it in a digital sense. And this interplay is very important and very useful. When we're saying transformation, and this is just that I'm, I'm trying to explain the terminology in the title of the manuscript. The idea is that the digital will become physical, physical can become digital. So if you have a 3D model of an asset, let's say a building, because we're used to thinking of buildings, it, you know, after construction becomes physical and you can also, uh, you know, do some scanning of that building and make it digital Again, so there's a transformation of information about that asset from being digital to physical, physical to digital, digital and physical, etc. Another transformation would be about, is it targeted and actual? Something that you want to deliver is delivered and then something that you want to change becomes targeted and then you change it becomes physical and on and on and go. You, you, you design, you construct, you redesign, you reconstruct, you demolish, you reconstruct. Something targeted and actual is a transformation of information. Uh, it's not just a transformation of the asset. Um, and also transformation what's needed and what's available. And I'll explain this uh, in, in, in a couple of slides uh, uh, later on. Now we're discussing exchange, and this is uh, really where the light framework relies a lot on uh, something called active net network theory. I mean, meaning it's, there's a lot to learn from, from, from that theory, but the idea is that really all actors need to be treated the same. Whether the actor you know, managing this information is a human, and there is a human to human interaction or whether that actor is a machine, I meaning it could be a robot, uh, it could be a cyborg, a combination between you know, a machine and a human. And this is no longer science fiction is starting to happen. So we have to deal with it in our 
uh, information frameworks. So the exchange is not always between humans. Of course not. It could be between the human and a system and between a system and a system. And the framework takes uh, you know, a good care of not to antagonize, not to, you know, discriminate against robots, against actors who are not human. At, at the same time, it needs to account for human actors, and it is, an, it is a framework for human actors as they interact with other uh, actors. Quick overview. It's not going to be enough, so um, let's see what we can do. So this is an overview of the, the light uh, framework, okay? Blue and pink and circles, and I don't know what there's so much into within this image alone, but funny enough, it summarizes a lot of concepts. I'm gonna try to take you through them as much as I can. So what are these, these components? There's many, I mean, there's 10 main ones, okay? I'm gonna as much as possible, try to explain some of these uh, in the short time uh, available. Statuses and states, milestones and gates. You could, could write a song about the light framework and it could be a hit. Let's start with the first one. What's the difference between, you know, two different statuses? It's very important. At the very basic level, we need to deal with information Okay, and now if you remember information about the world, information about the physical asset, information about the digital asset, all could be either targeted, something that you want and you need, you intend to deliver and something which is actual. And there's a line separating them. You know, a difference between I want this, uh, 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 you know, I want to build it, I know it's built. Okay, this is as, as basic as it is. And these, the, the, the understanding that every asset whether physical or digital will have these states and they will change these states very quickly is very important for the working of the, the framework. Because as I said in the, at the beginning, for the framework to be more useful, it needs at the end to be delivered as a tool. Okay, and, and the, the intention behind the light framework is to deliver a tool and that tool is an open access digital platform for all to use. And I'll explain this a little bit more later on. So that's the first one. Let's go to the second one. When we're dealing with information, we have three states. One we call the, the purposes state. You know, what's the purpose of delivering any asset? And then what is this deliverable that we want, you know, to deliver? So what is it, you know, what are its properties? And then what are the resources and methods needed for that deliverable? You know, I want to deliver a, a, a car or a, or a pump or a building, okay? To deliver that, what are the resources, the materials, what are the methods of production, what the methods of procurement, you know, all these things that needed, that need to be defined. And the word defined is very important. As I mentioned before about maturity, everything that needs to be managed needs to be first defined. So the idea here in these states that we need to define the purpose, define the deliverable as clearly, as accurately as possible, and then define the resources and method needed to, uh, to generate that deliverable. We go to the third, uh, you know, uh, component, and this, uh, again, it combines the first two by saying, you know, above the line, we have the target, below the line, we have the actual, we have the purposes, we have the deliverables, we have the defined uh, resources and methods. Here, it just becomes a little bit more specific. So we're saying for information to flow across the life cycle of an asset, it goes through eight milestones. And the claim is, or you know, what the light framework claims are that these milestones are natural. They're not made up. I did not make them up, you know, we did not just, you know, pluck them out of, of thin air. They are there, and, and this is just a description of them. That's the claim. Okay, someone, you know, someone will come, no, oh, you missed the milestone, or you, you have to add uh, this or remove this. That's great. Please come back with your suggestions about whether these milestones are not natural. They're not as they appear in the wild, and we're trying to describe them. Of course, the way we describe them is based on our previous research about how we want to use them. 
but the claim is that these are the natural milestones. So what are these milestones? First, you have to have an intention to deliver something, okay? So you wanna deliver an asset, I have an intention to, to deliver a, a, uh, a hospital. And then, okay, so we say, well, fine, what uh, then you need to define that deliverable, you know, where, where, where is it located? How many, you know, uh, levels, how many operating uh, theaters, um, et cetera. You need to define it, uh, define the deliverable, uh, all its performance deliver deliverables, its physical deliverables, you know, spatial, et cetera. Um, now, anything worth um, doing nowadays, if it's not, you know, a cabin, uh, you know, at the top of a hill that you want to build yourself, it needs to be done in a digital way, it need to be managed in a digital way. So here, the light framework, if you want, isolates that it only caters for assets that require some kind of digital um, uh, exchange. So it, you cannot apply to build, a, a, you know, a sand castle on the beach. Okay, you cannot, or you don't need to apply it if you want, if you are an owner builder sitting at the top of the hill, you have an ax and you, you're cutting down trees that you're allowed to cut and you're building your, your, your cabin. It applies to assets that need some kind of digital uh, asset alongside the physical asset. So after you define the physical asset, you need to define the digital deliverables. You know, what, what models do I need? what documents do I need, what data sets I need to exchange, et cetera, and, 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 in, and compare them to, to really uh, the physical asset or deliver I, want, I need to deliver. So I want a, a, a hospital. To deliver this hospital, I need uh, you know, 3D models and 2D documentation, and I, I need plans for, for you know, patient rooms, I need this, I need that, etc. So really here you're describing the digital uh, um, deliverables, whether the mod uh, models, documents, or data sets needed to deliver the digital, the, sorry, the physical asset that you need. After that, and this is the natural progression, you need to say, okay, if this is what we need, we really need to define the resources and methods. So I need, I need someone who can build a, a hospital, someone with experience. I need, uh, you know, to use this uh, procurement method. I want this production method, et cetera, et cetera. So we define the need, the resources and methods. And, and we're, we're, we're dealing with these assets as if it's in, where we go through this progression as if this is the first time we build that asset. Now, if we're building that asset, uh, you know, for the second time or the third time or more, there's different ways of doing it. I'm going to explain this in the next, you know, in a, in, in a future component. So after defining the purpose, the, the physical asset, the digital uh, asset that needs to be delivered, the digital deliverable for that asset and the resources are needed, now the execution starts. First, you know, we we have to I need these resources. Now we, 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 we do the, our procurement, we do our pre-qualification, we select our methods, and now we have the actual or available resources and methods that we really can deploy. So sometimes not everything that we want to deploy is available, could, the resources could be missing, uh, the competencies could be missing. So really it's about what's available. And now from that on, we are in the actual side, we are delivering the digital assets, from the digital assets uh, we are using to deliver the physical assets. And then uh, after that, we reach uh, milestone eight, which here, uh, we, it's another about purpose and intent. Do we intend to demolish this asset? Uh, do you intend to refurbish it, reuse it, recycle it? All these decisions are there. Now, another thing here before moving to the next slide is the, the, the principle of couples, and this is very important. If you're looking at the whole life cycle, it's very important to compare the in, initial intent with the intent at the end, because these feed into each other. It's very important to be able to compare uh, the expected physical deliverables with the actual physical deliverables. We call this the physical couple, okay, because this will tell us if there's a deviation between what is delivered with what was expected. Also the same when it comes to digital couple, you know, comparing what was delivered, 
you know, all the models, all the, you know, the model uses, all the documents compared to what was intended, what was targeted, was, you know, something not delivered. You know, so someone asked, I want to do cost estimation based on models, and then the cost estimation is delivered based on documents, you know, then there's something, you know, missing. And this coupling, digital couple allows us to do it. Another couple here is the difference between, uh, you know, what we wanted to, to resource to be used, what kind of methods needed to be deployed, and what actually was deployed. These are very important couple because uh, it's about measurement, it's about validation and veri uh, verification. There's also two more couples. And these, you know, couple between the physical uh, deliverable and digital deliverable, of course, I've explained this before, they need to be coupled, meaning you, you don't want to deliver uh, digital uh, things or really plan to deliver the digital things which do not serve the, the physical uh, output. And one of the things that now became famous now, you know, nowadays, uh, which is the uh, the assets couple and what people refer to a digital twin, you know, or, you know, uh, uh, asset couple are a little bit more uh, broader than a digital twin, but the idea is uh, we could compare, we could, uh, you know, replicate, uh, we could manage, uh, you know, by coupling the digital asset and the physical asset. Okay, and this coupling works both ways. Uh, you know, you could have a, a, a digital uh, uh, representation of an asset that becomes physical, you know, through construction, fabrication, but also the physical asset could be made digital uh, through, you know, laser scanning, connecting to IOTs, etc. These couples are uh, natural, uh, they're not made up, and they are very powerful in allowing measurement, verification, and valid, uh, validation. I think I'm, I'm eating through the time, so I'm going to speed up a bit. The idea now here in, in Information Flow 4 is that, you know, when we go from these milestones from 1 to 8, and, you know, we continue, we go through gates. And these gates, uh, you know, uh, control the flow of information. And the, the framework defines uh, four different flows that need to be controlled. A forward flow, it's called execution. So, you know, once you, you, you are executing, let's say, if we, people understand these two things uh, more than they understand the others. So if you have a digital and you want to execute to become physical, so you have a 3D model that you will make it a physical model. So you have a 3D uh, model of a pump and then you manufacture it and you have a physical pump, but there's also a reverse flow. It's about uh, management to see if the, what was delivered was according to what was specified. You know, what is physical confirm, confirms or conforms with what uh, it, it was digital. And this is true for any movement backwards. So the framework here defines any movement forward as execution, and any movement backwards as uh, measurement, and they they come together, they're coupled. They're not disjointed like other frameworks. It's not like you have different stages and then you have a testing phase. No, for every step forward, there is a step backwards, reverse step. Every moving, uh, movement towards execution must be coupled with a measurement step to see if what was executed was according to what was specified. There's also two more directions of flow. One's called integration, which goes inward, or capturing, and one's called sharing, which goes outward. Uh, I will explain this in a, in a different slide. But these four are connected together. And if you have time, these gates uh, are, are really important because they, 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 um, they use actually agile approaches in managing these flows. Now, another very important differentiation between the, the light approach and all other approaches is the, the Im embedding of the idea of automation or the concepts of automation or the prospects of automation within the framework. It's not like an afterthought. It is in, in, with, it's built inside it. You will go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you are using computer-assisted, meaning if you are you're, you're, you're doing uh, you know um, an asset 
and you're using some kind of digital means, uh, you need to define the physical asset and the, 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 then the, the, uh, define the digital deliverables, the resource and method, etc. But what about if we're doing this again? You know, what about if we're building the same building and in, in a, you know, at a different site, let's say, or repeating the, the generation of the same pump? If this, this is the case, we really don't need to define the resources and methods because we've already defined them. We're just repeating the delivery of that asset, okay? If this is the case, and there's other cases, we really don't need to go through four and five. And this is what's called the route two or the automated automatic, automatic route, okay? It's, it's no longer about going through this because you don't need it, it's already predefined. Same thing, what about if we have a, a, a really a, a artificial in, intelligence enabled uh, robot that we could tell them to build a bridge across the, the river uh, with these properties. Okay, and this is not too far off, okay? You can say, I want a bridge. I want it to carry these numbers of cars per, per, per I don't know what, the load, this is a dynamic load, static load, etc. And we could imagine doesn't have to be tomorrow. We could imagine that this system, this actor, would be able to calculate everything that needs to be calculated, use the resources and methods, uh, you know, uh, autonomously, and to build that uh, bridge for us. Okay. Uh, in that case, we don't need digital deliverables. We don't need them to be targeted. We don't need them to be to be delivered. We don't need to define the resources and method because the autonomous player, that very smart robot, which is coming to help us, not to kill us, um, will be able to do this autonomously. And this is very important. This is not far off. And you, have to don't, you don't have to think of assets, again, just to remind you, you don't have to think of assets as these huge structures, bridges and buildings. It could be a small asset. It is now, you can now ask, uh, you know, an autonomous player, uh, a, you know, a 3D printer enabled by, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and machine, let's say machine learning, to deliver for you a small piece of equipment to serve a specific function autonomously. You just give it the material, you define what you need, and voila, you, you get it. You can get that asset. Now, the framework allows for that. It allows for these different routes, okay, which could happen at the same time. Assisted, the long route, automated or automatic, the shorter route, and autonomous, the shortest route. Now, we go to the component number six. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one because it needs a little bit more time. The idea is that when we're doing any kind of iteration, we go through loops. And this is really derived from the agile approach to what's called sprints, but it applied here to assets. The idea is uh, you, you, let's say we, we um, you know, say we want to deliver some kind of, uh, you know, 3D model uh, cost estimation. And we discovered that there is some needed some change for that cost estimation that our assumptions were wrong. We have to repeat it. That's what we call this a short loop. We're still within the design. So during the design, there's lots of iterations or loops. What about to deliver something which is not fit for purpose? That's a longer loop. We have to go back to defining the, the, the physical uh, deliverable, do the digital deliverable, et cetera, and do a long loop. Now, and the longest or full loop is really the life cycle of the asset itself, you know, the reuse, et cetera. Now, so there's other, other concepts to cover here about, you know, the connection between uh, delivering the physical asset and intend to reuse it. Um, there is a, something here called the life extender. Uh, to the, so he, he, this life extender extends the framework from being to cover a project life cycle to an asset life cycle. And there's something called the life cycle connector that connects the end of one cycle to the start of another. So you you are using a you know a uh, a piece piece of equipment for one reason and you refurbish it. And uh, you're in, you know you change your intent, you, you change your 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 specifications, you 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 change that equipment or you change that uh, asset, and now it has another life cycle. Okay, we start again. In the framework, you will notice that 
uh, any, any connection between these milestones will have a forward and reverse action. Again, these can be easily defined at high level and at lower levels. And you will see with, uh, with the presentation uh, by, uh, by Professor uh, Regina that she will cover uh, some of these actions. Uh, so, so here we're going from one to two, we have forward one, two, from two, two to three, there's forward two, three at the same time, there's uh, reverse three, two, from three to six, et cetera. And you will find in the, in the document, in the manuscript that I'm hoping that you will download and read and provide your suggestions and questions, these are defined. You know, how you, you know, what are the main actions to go from one milestone to the other and from that milestone in reverse when it comes to, to measurement. In the manuscript, we, you know, it, the, the, the capturing and sharing activities are not covered, but it will be in a future um, paper. One very important concept also of the framework is the concept of shortcuts. Now, when people hear shortcuts, they run to the doors, okay? Oh no, people are taking shortcuts. No, shortcuts on their own are neither good or bad, okay? Actually, the, 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 the life cycle information transformation, the light framework or light approach encourages valid shortcuts, okay? You know, you, there are valid shortcuts and, and shortcuts and risky shortcuts. So valid shortcuts are shortcuts that satisfy the requirements of, of taking these shortcuts. But if you take a shortcut which is not allowed, meaning you, you're trying to skip important things, you are taking risks. The more you skip, the more you increase or you, you compound the risk. Uh, so, so for example, let's say I'm, 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 myself and my wife and daughters, we want to, I don't know, build a, you know, a, a cubby house in the background and we want to do it in digital mode, etc. cetera. We, we don't have to define you know, the needed resources. We know who they are, correct? This is from the intention. So we can skip that step, okay? Um, uh, some things do, need, do not need a, a digital uh, and deliverable. It could be because uh, that specific small asset is, uh, uh, you know, it's just gonna be, I don't know, made by hand and as part of the, the whole thing, uh, we could skip defining that digital deliverable, et cetera, et cetera. And you will find in the, the paper the valid reasons uh, and the risks from skipping certain milestones. Now skipping, again, skipping a milestone is not banned in the framework. It could be even encouraged. It just depends if you have a valid reason or you don't have a valid reason. Okay, so for, let's take uh, for an example of valid reason two, meaning to skip milestone two. It is, this is valid if no physical assets are targeted for design or delivery within the current information cycle or loop. And again, remember, you could have multiple loops for smaller assets. Don't always think of asset as the big building. It could be uh, one column, okay? It could be one floor. It could be one building within a campus. But also there's a potential risk for missing that, which is risk of delivering a physical asset that um, do not match the demand entity's original intent, okay? So unless uh, you, know, you know what you're doing, you cannot skip a milestone. Now we go to component number nine. I promise there's only two more. And, uh, and this is also, uh, you know, one of the things important about the light approach is that it does not look at information as if they are documents. There is no definition of, let's start with, uh, I don't know, organization information requirement and then asset information requirement. And then I don't know what exchange information requirement. And then you have AIM and, PIM and I really don't, no longer can keep track of all this. It deals with information flow. Information flow from one milestone to another is just an aggregation and, and this integration, uh, integration of information. So you could start with, you could imagine you're doing a simple uh, you know, uh, asset. Uh, you could start with wh why you want you know, to deliver this, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know who said hospital, it could be 10 questions. Okay, that's the purpose. Then it becomes 100 or 1,000 fields to define the specifications of 
that, uh, you know, digital deliverable for that hospital. Then it could be another 200 fields to collect information about the digital requirements for delivering that um, hospital. And then it would be another 200 fields about the resources and methods, etc. And now when we go to the actual, so we're, we're from the target to the actual, we're starting to populate this information adding more information, removing more information. The information is growing as we go along the routes. Okay, it's the same approach to collecting information irrespective of what you're doing. The only difference would be what are you collecting and when. And, and the way that the framework deals with this is by, by creating a unified pool, but which is collected through sets. So we start with set A, which covers the intent and you know the purpose and the specification, then a set B, which really tries to match the digital deliverables with the physical deliverables, and set C tries to match the the the, the physical and digital uh, intended deliverables, which what the resources are needed, and four and five here set D to try to uh, establish what are the real available uh, resources compared and etc cetera, etc cetera. so the idea is the information is growing it's flowing it's it's, in, it's being enriched it's being reduced but it's the same pool it's not really we're not using documents to 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 manage our information information flows it's connected to knowledge of humans connected to data streams and and this is really the the idea and you can read about this uh, more in the paper the idea of the last component is the, about of what information to collect some information are not needed. You know, they are outside our, our area of concern. And these need just to be referenced, uh, like how you reference a code or a standard, but also some information needs to be defined and included in our common information environment. And some information needs to be managed through our process and other information need to be integrated, etc. So not all information, um, you know, are, are needed or is needed. And the, info, the information that is needed, some of them they needed just to be collated in a harmonized way. Other information need to be managed through a system and others need to be integrated. And of course, further optimized. I think I'm run out of time. So really the framework introduces lots of metrics. We have two main ones, integration metric, can read about it, how you know information goes from reference to optimized, and autonomy, uh, or you know, uh, the idea that uh, you know the activities could be manual, assisted, automated, automatic, or autonomous. Also, these are metrics. Um, I'm just gonna go to a summary, quick summary. What what does the framework offers? And of course, it learns from all other uh, you know methods and philosophies and and all these approaches, but, but the framework is not, it's not intended to be, to be a philosophy. It's not a philosophy. Uh, if it is, a, it will fail as a philosophy. It is a practical solution aimed as delivering uh, a platform, okay? It is not a method. It's not a method. It is, it claims to be a natural progression of information, just explains them in a way that is measurable and predictable. Okay, so over time you would be able to predict information flow if you're using, you know, like the same type of asset, etc. If you were going through all these loops and routes, you'll be able to predict. Um, so, what's uh, what does uh, you know in summary? What does the last framework offer? It's an open knowledge structure, you know, under Creative Commons. Uh, you know, all it has different parts, and you will see, you know, very important part, uh, you know, uh, explained later on. Um, it's actor agnostic, procurement agnostic. You can apply any kind of procurement model to it, you know, from from traditional uh, contracts to IPD and etc. Domain agnostic, you know, assets doesn't have to be buildings or anything. Could be anything. Could be any kind of asset, which even some some things coming from from different domains uh, like manufacturing. Asset scale independent, it is allows for all information flows, computer assisted, autonomous, automatic. Um, it moves beyond digital, you know, twins to couples and couples, it's much more flexible than the concept of twins because it allows decoupling and partial coupling, etc. There's lots of things about coupling that can be discussed. I haven't discussed this today, but the, the idea is the way it deals with assets allows its tokenization, meaning dealing with an asset as a token that can be 
uh, exchange, you know, could be connected, uh, whether through centralized ledgers, centralized databases, or, you know, um, distributed ledgers, or what's called blockchain, if you want, um, treats execution and measurement equally. It's not like a phase. Measurement is not a phase. It is every action has a measurement reverse action. It integrates different types of flows, execution, forward, measurement, capturing of data into, into, into environments, sharing. I didn't cover sharing today, but the idea is sharing through, through you know, exporting, uh, through sharing uh, knowledge as well, which I'm not, I didn't cover today. It's, it has a, a, a very, uh, you know, it has an agile at, um, activity engine at its heart within the, the gates. I did not cover this in detail today allows garages, you know, let's say allows taking shortcuts to reduce process waste. This is very important. Process waste is one of the worst things that, that have happened to us since the introduction of BIM. You know, BIM has had lots of advantages, but it also causes a lot of digital and process waste. Um, there's a model activity flows. This will be covered uh, by the Regina later on. I did not cover this, but the idea is the framework connects information flows to data streams and also to, to knowledge exchanges. Unified pool of information. It is semantically consistent. Why? Because this is of a this is based on a on a different uh, project called the dictionary. Every term in the framework is connected to an online dictionary, which is available in multiple language uh, languages, including Portuguese. International by design. This is not done for Australia first, and then we make it international. You know, like many things that you know, it's not done. Uh, it's done international uh, by default by design, etc. It's uh, there's an audit trail, etc. Open it's it's optimized for delivering open access platforms. And actually, I repeat this twice somewhere. Uh, embeds metrics, etc. And this is the repetition. This is when you finish your slides late. This is what happens. Now, food for thought. Uh, integration of information across an asset life cycle depends on, very importantly, clear definition of needed information. If you don't have clear definition, you really can't manage that. So if you have clear definition of needed information, you can manage that. And if you can manage that, if you have definition and you can properly manage it, you can integrate that information. So if you don't, if you don't have defined information, you cannot manage it. If you don't manage information, you cannot integrate it, okay? And if you don't manage information uh, and integrate it, there's no hope of supply chain integration. So we can only integrate our supply chain in our industry by focusing, fixing, improving, continuously optimizing our information integration behaviors. That will lead us to supply chain integration. So if we can't, improve our industry to become vertically integrated because it's impossible for our industry. We can definitely work hard and attempt and hopefully succeed in integrated information, which really takes us a long way uh, towards uh, supply, uh, supply chain integration. This is very quick. Uh, you know, extending this would be through the community effort and we're uh, you know, always looking for supporters and, and sponsors. Uh, we have, we're, we're, there's lots of things that still to be developed. We're looking for collaborators. Uh, we, we're looking to start testing. Uh, my colleague, uh, Eric Poirier in, in Quebec, he started uh, some of this testing, first theoretical testing, and then it will be on location um, testing. And we, we want to attract a sponsor for the digital platform because this is built to deliver an open access platform. All right, so this is based on initiative. Uh, please go to bimexcellence.org and look at different projects. So we have the dictionary, we have all these things and the, 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 I'm presenting today is part of project F. Sorry, I cannot cover this in any detail, but uh, uh, the light frame was part of project F. This is project A, the dictionary, please visit or maybe Regina will maybe touch upon this later on. Project F, which covers the framework, uh, has lots of micro projects in it. Uh, one of the micro projects uh, is, we refer to as F2 model use template and is led by a group of uh, Amazonians uh, that you will uh, learn about shortly. 
And I finish by thanking uh, Baris Neto, you know, the organizers, the sponsors, everyone, and inviting you to attend our first excellence seminar, you know, for the Vimy Initiative. We, we have it over three days, the 24th, the 25th, and 26th uh, at 8 a.m. This is my time to, you know, to make you all wake up early. So between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., uh, Sao Paulo, three days, uh, we'll be covering uh, all these projects I just mentioned. And thank you again. Barros Neto, you are muted. Barros Neto. Yes. Oh, Microfone está desligado. <laughs> yes. It's uh, this problem with a uh, digital world. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Sucker, for your presentation. It's a very, very challenging for us. It's a very, very smart. Uh, thank you so much. And thank now, you. Uh, uh, Regina, por favor, sua vez agora. Ok. Bom, primeiro agradeço o convite, dizer que é uma honra estar aqui falando ao lado do Bilal Zucker e é, vamos lá, vamos começar. Vou, ah, eu vou pedir para vocês, enquanto eu estiver falando, vocês lembrarem então da apresentação do Light Framework, que em português seria uh, Framework Lite, né? Light Framework. Presta atenção nas palavras propósito, purpose, entrega, deliverable, resource and methods, que são os, os recursos e métodos. Presta atenção em modelo, dados e documentos, model, data, documents. Presta atenção em ativos em, e também em open knowledge structure, em sharing knowledge, né? Porque tudo que ele, que o Bilal Sucker acabou de uh, falar de uma forma muito bem colocada, que eu vejo como ser a solução da falta de integração, uh, da fragmentação da indústria da construção civil, né? o que ele apresentou é a solução que a gente quer, como a gente imagina a construção civil desfragmentada, né? com, a com a informação fluindo. O que eu vou apresentar aqui, para vocês, vocês vão ver, é um tijolo desse processo, é um tijolo fundamental desse processo, tá? E tudo que ele, de certa forma, mas não como ele colocou, tá? Está presente, então, no que eu vou apresentar. Então, eu vou apresentar para vocês o projeto F2, que é denominado Model Use Templates. Se eu fosse traduzir para português, Model Use Templates, eu, eu diria gabaritos de usos do BIM. Ou, nós já incorporamos a palavra template em português, templates de usos do modelo. Tá? Vocês notam? que o, o Zucker, ele de certa forma já vê a indústria da arquitetura, engenharia e construção com o BIM incorporado. Então a palavra BIM não existe mais, sumiu o BIM. Então eu não tenho mais usos do BIM, eu tenho usos do modelo. Ele entende né? o modelo, o modelo digital, o modelo físico, né? visto como um asset. Aqui está o grupo que desenvolveu o que eu vou apresentar. Nós somos liderados pela Fernanda, que é, fez mestrado na Unicamp, atualmente trabalha na Autodesk, a Fernanda Machado. É, também estivemos, tem, está conosco a Lorena Moreira, que é professora na UFBA. Temos a Paula Mota, que é de Fortaleza, da Cipro. E recentemente integrou-se ao grupo o Bruno também da Cipro, Bruno Mota, tá? E também tem conosco o Bilal e nós somos um grupo que é feito de acadêmicos e profissionais da arquitetura, engenharia e construção. 
Então, vou falar de model users, né? Então, vou falar de model users que, às vezes, nas transparências, vão aparecer como MU, MU. Toda vez que eu estiver me referindo a model users, na verdade, eu estou falando de usos do BIM. Estou falando de aplicações do BIM em processos específicos. Essas aplicações do BIM em processos específicos são esses domain model users, que na, na iniciativa BIM-E é, são listados em 76 model users, domain model users. Esses uh, usos específicos são, então, de, distribuídos em categorias de captura e representação, de planejamento e projeto, de simulação, quantificação, construção e fabricação, operação e manutenção, monitoramento e controle e o link né, com, e, e uma visão estendida desses uh, modelos. Né? E... Aqui eu trouxe exemplos específicos desses 76 model users, que é a documentação 2D. Então, você extrair a documentação de um modelo, BIM, é um, uma, uma aplicação do modelo. Fazer, fazer o planejamento da construção mediado por BIM é um model use. Fazer a detecção de interferências né, durante o processo de projeto é um model use. Fazer a fabricação de formas, a gestão de ativos, automação predial, interface do BIM com a internet das coisas, todos os exemplos de model users. Agora, os model users, eles uh, são, uh, eles fazem parte, toda, toda a implementação BIM, tá? dentro dela tem a, a definição de model users, né? Então, todo plano de implementação BIM, todo plano de execução BIM, tem dentro dele a grande necessidade de você especificar, então, que model users você quer fazer uso de. Esses uh, model users são processos complexos, eles são partes específicas da nossa prática. A orçamentação, o cálculo estrutural, né? O, a, a autoria, né, onde, onde saia a concepção do projeto. E esses model users, que são processos, na verdade, complexos, são descritos de forma superficial pela maioria das referências que nós temos hoje. Mas aqui eu gosto de fazer uma ligação com o BIM Dictionary, que é um projeto da iniciativa BIM-E. Tá? O BIM Dictionary estabelece uma base para o conhecimento compartilhado. Então, os model users aparecem dentro do BIM Dictionary como termos que tem ali a sua a descrição. Mas por serem uh, termos, né, uh, processos complexos, se nós descrevermos esses model users de uma forma mais detalhada e se nós agregarmos essa descrição dos model users ao BIM Dictionary, a gente tem valor agregado de uma forma compartilhada, aberta. Mas como são tantos, né, são todas as ah, partes da nossa prática, nossa prática é como mostrou o Zucker, contínua, né, é, que vai em vários sentidos, no sentido de executar, o sentido de reverso, de medir, né, somente é possível a gente fazer essa descrição detalhada de todos os model users, né, se nós tivermos a contribuição de muitos. Então, vou explicar o que, que, é, o, que, que o Model Use pretende. O que, que o template, né? o que, que esse gabarito para o um Model Use pretende? Ele pretende educar, avaliar e auxiliar. Educar, avaliar e auxiliar indivíduos e organizações. Educar sobre os benefícios, avaliar as capacidades de entrega e auxiliar o desenvolvimento de competências cada um sobre um model use específico. Agora falando sobre a linha do tempo desse microprojeto F2. Tudo começou em 2018, quando a Fernanda recebeu o convite do uh, Sucar para iniciar esse projeto. A Fernanda então chamou a mim, a Lorena e a Paula 
E junto com o Sucar e mais o Eric, praticamente por um ano e meio, nós ficamos fazendo a... Não, primeiro tinha, era só nós quatro e o Sucar. Fizemos o desenvolvimento da conceitualização. O que seria esse template para descrever o modo use? Qual era a estrutura conceitual? As informações que deviam estar ali? Como elas deviam estar classificadas, categorizadas? Como elas eram representadas em forma de propriedades e seus campos? Terminado isso, então nós aplicamos o template para descrever um modo use específico, que no caso foi detecção de interfaces, de interferências. E foi feito um desenvolvimento na, no Bing Dictionary, que já estava online, para ele incorporar, então, essa, no, essa forma estendida de apresentar a informação. Em 2020, então, nós começamos a pensar numa estratégia de como multiplicar esse efeito de multiplicação, aplicar o Model Use Template para todos os 76 Model Users. Né? Então, nós pensamos numa, como recrutar pessoas, como, uh, uh, que equipe deveria ser essa, que ferramentas que essas pessoas iam precisar, que documentos que elas, de partidas elas precisariam, como nós faríamos a gestão disso. Então, no momento, nós estamos iniciando um, um, um processo de uma gestão piloto. E, a partir de 2021, fazer, então, iniciar o processo de desenvolvimento para descrever os 76 Model Uses, segundo esse template, e incorporar ao Bing Dictionary. Agora, então, aqui uma visão do que é o template. O template, ele descreve o Model Use como uma informação estruturada em categorias, propriedades e campos. As categorias são básicas, avançadas, de desenho do, de fluxos de atividade e referências. Então, agora eu vou mostrar esse template sendo aplicado para o Clash Detection, para a identificação ou detecção de interferências, que dentro da, da categorização dos Model Uses, ele é, ele é chamado de 4040. Então, falando das propriedades básicas, o que são? Uma identificação e uma breve descrição do Model Use. Mostrando aqui para Clash Detection, tá? Então, aqui primeiro o conjunto de identificação. Que série ela participa? Então, participa da Simulation and Quantifying, simulação e quantificação. Qual é a, 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 o número da série e o número do Model Use? Então, 4.000, depois do 4.040. Qual é o título? Clash Detection, detecção de interferências a versão que está atualmente, e a short description, a descrição breve. Essa descrição breve aqui, ela é a descrição breve que já existia é, em português no Bing Dictionary. Então, no Bing Dictionary está dito que a detecção de interferências é um uso do modelo, representando o uso do modelo 3D para coordenar diferentes disciplinas e para identificar, resolver possíveis conflitos entre elementos virtuais antes da construção ou fabricação. Aqui eu tenho o link para o Bing Dictionary. Depois, propósito. Qual é o propósito? Purpose. É fornecer modelos Bing que dentro do linguajar do Bing Dictionary é denominado de Bing Models. Bing Models. Então, fornecer modelos BIM livre de interferências, identificar problemas na fase de projeto, verificar se há interferências entre sistemas e componentes, então, verificar no ativo digital, melhorar a colaboração entre a equipe de trabalho e entre equipes de, trabalho, de projeto e acompanhar a resolução do conflito. Então, ele faz toda, esses são todos os propósitos, né? Então, eu não só quero encontrar a interferência, mas eu quero acompanhar a solução daquela interferência. E com isso, tá? gerar né, colaboração entre os envolvidos. Propriedades avançadas. As propriedades avançadas são descrição dos recursos do suporte do modelo BIM. Então, é, então aqui a gente vê, né? Resources. Então, os, os recursos são documentos, dados, sistemas, 
softwares, equipamentos e métodos. E a, na próxima slide eu vou mostrar exemplo de software e métodos. Então aqui a gente tem a tabela de todos os possíveis é, uh, recursos em termos de software necessários para desenvolver esse model use específico. Essa tabela, eu vou clicar, ela está é, formada, é, é, colocada, disponível em forma de Airtable, em que eu posso, então, aqui, tá, filtrar e ver, é, é, fazer sort, a, agrupar informação, né? E a gente já vê aqui uma, uma evolução do uso dessa tabela. Essa tabela, ela vai aumentar enquanto model uses novos forem descritos no template e eu vou ver para um software específico a lista de todos os model uses que esse software dá suporte a. Então, quando eu chegar no final dos 76 model uses colocados em forma de template, eu tenho essa tabela completa e eu começo agora a ter noção de o que um software específico, ele, em quantos usos ele pode me dar suporte a. Né? Aqui também eu tenho uma descrição é, genérica do método, tá? que é, é método de gestão de qualidade, então super interessante a gente entender que a detecção de interferências faz parte da gestão de qualidade e que existem métodos específicos, né, de, uh, deixa eu ver, ah, perdi aqui, wait a minute, não, ixi, bom, então deixa eu voltar aqui, ok, e fluxo, a, a próxima propriedade, a próxima categoria é fluxo de atividades, onde a gente faz, então, a explanação das atividades necessárias para executar um model use. Aqui, então, a gente tem dentro dessa propriedade a atividade colocada em forma de fluxo, tá? E para cada uma das atividades, a gente tem a descrição dela em três níveis. Essa aqui foi a, a propriedade que mais nos deu trabalho, né? E que mais nos faz é, revisar e compreender esse uso, e revisar todas as outras propriedades. Aqui eu vou, ela é disponibilizada no Bing Dictionary como um, um diagrama uh, feito em, em Drawio. Então aqui eu agora já, me, já fui para o Bing Dictionary, tá vendo? Já estou no Bing Dictionary. Já estou no termo Clash Detection, que tem aqui uma descrição lateral que tem a ver com as, o, as propriedades do template. Né? E, e já tenho aqui a minha table, a minha Airtable do, do, para Software Tools. E aqui eu posso entrar, visualizar uh, o meu fluxo de forma maximizada e entender. Vale a pena dizer que a gente... Para chegar nesse fluxo, nós passamos por uma, um ciclo de conversa com o Sucre é, bastante estressante. Porque enquanto a gente não chegou no fluxo que fosse o mais linear possível, e é muito difícil colocar um uso dentro de uma descrição linear, com o mínimo de loops existentes, a gente não conseguia receber um ok do Sucre. E esse estresse que ele nos fez passar foi muito interessante, porque agora a gente chegou num fluxo muito macro e é, importante. E também ele, uh, ele também guia qualquer um que queira criar uma disciplina que fale de uh, compatibilização de projetos em BIM, ele sabe exatamente o que ele deve ensinar. Ele deve começar pela estratégia, né? Ele, é, qual vai ser a estratégia dele de definição do, daquele, é, de, de encontrar as interferências. Depois ele tem que preparar os modelos, os monomodelos, né? Depois ele tem que 
preparar o modelo para federar, para juntar, depois ele tem que fazer o modelo federado junto estar consistente, ele tem que executar a interferência, ele tem que fazer análise das interferências e ir para a solução da interferência. Geralmente, todos os vídeos que nós encontramos que são free e explicam é, como fazer uma clash detection, geralmente estão num momento específico de, perform, de, de performar, de executar a interferência, mas fazer é, o model use, executar esse information flow, tá? é, realmente você tem que passar por todas essas etapas. Eu posso chegar aqui e tá? exportar, e aí ele me leva para dentro do Droyo, tá? Onde eu então tenho acesso. Deixa eu ver aqui, ele não me levou no momento. Não me levou. Eu vim para cá. Bom, ele me leva para dentro do. Yeah, maybe press the edit uh, the pencil. It's because I have the share and the stop of the, which doesn't let me go to the. If you go back to the dictionary, Regina, uh -huh. and press, press on the pencil. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So, aí eu, eu, aí eu recebo aqui a, o, 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 o diagrama feito em Drawio, onde eu posso, então, agora adaptar para mim, para o meu fluxo na minha empresa. Por isso que isso aqui é chamado de um template, ele é um gabarito. Ele é um gabarito muito detalhado, mas que você, quando abaixa e faz uso dele na sua empresa, você pode se apropriar, faz uso dele no ensino, você pode adaptar, se apropriar a ele, mas tendo um ponto de partida comum, ok? Cada uma dessas atividades dentro da, uh, do template são descritas, né? Então, eu tenho definir a estratégia de detecção de conflitos. Eu tenho que identificar os pré-requisitos de detecção. De identificar pré-requisitos do modelo, identificar pré-requisitos da documentação, identificar pré-requisitos do conjunto de dados. Então, a gente vê aqui o lead, o framework lead, presente nesse fluxo de informação. Né? E eu tenho esse detalhamento em formas de atividades para todo o meu flow desenhado. Aqui também eu posso, uh, vou mostrar isso ao final, mas eu posso exportar, faz, fazer um link, posso fazer um export. Is it here where I export? Yeah. Eu posso exportar aquele... Uh, aquela visão esquemática né, do, do template, mas agora aqui em forma textual, né, uh, ela está aqui em forma textual representada. Eu também, a gente levantou muitas referências em termos de artigo de periódicos, capítulos de livro e esforços similares. Depois que nós passamos por esse processo de aplicar o template para o modo use de detecção, de detecção de interferências, nós fizemos uma avaliação externa. Aplicamos, né, mostramos esse, uh, esse, uh, essa forma de descrever o um modo use para uma turma de alunos da pós-graduação da arquitetura, tecnologia e cidade da Unicamp e fizemos uma dinâmica de SWAT, de forças, oportunidades, fraquezas e ameaças. E dessa dinâmica saiu a, 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 os ali presentes, arquitetos e engenheiros, indicaram que esse template, essa forma de escrever model use, era detalhada, direta, prática, didática, clara, padronizada. A oportunidade, escassez, escassez de literatura sobre o assunto, então tem uma demanda né? e tem uma demanda de padronização, fraquezas, bom, a fraqueza está grande aqui, né? Poxa, seria bom que tivesse a força muito grande, mas nesse SWOT a fraqueza foi desenvolvimento complexo, requer muita experiência, 
visão detalhada e global ao mesmo tempo, muita informação é necessária, usa a linguagem própria e requer introdução. Nas, for nas ameaças, ações semelhantes, tempo de desenvolvimento para todos os MUs e uma interface hostil. Então, levando em consideração esse SWOT, o que você hoje vê no Bing Dictionary é um quarto daquilo que nós desenvolvemos na, no primeiro desenvolvimento, que já foi enxugado para apresentar no, no, no esquema conceitual que apresentei no início dessa apresentação e que ainda foi mais enxugado ainda para deixar disponível para o público, tá? para tornar é, essa forma de, a essência da essência, tornar ela como um conhecimento compartilhado. Depois que nós passarmos, né, depois que nós aplicarmos o Model Use Template para os 76 Model Uses, eu vou poder ter uma noção de métodos, então quais são os métodos aplicados, quais são os métodos compartilhados entre os uh, Model Uses, vou ter uma noção de, de compartilhamento de dados, então uh, o Zucker não falou de piscinas de informação? Eu vou começar a conseguir enxergar as piscinas de informação aqui quando eu olhar né, compartilhamento de informação entre os usos. Né? Então, eu vou ter um conhecimento compartilhado, mas eu também vou ter interfaces mais esclarecidas. Né? Então, a gente entende que o conhecimento compartilhado, essas interfaces esclarecidas, permitiram exatamente aquilo que a gente tinha como objetivo inicial, que é educar, então esse material fica disponível, ele é fonte de consulta ou de inspiração, de treinamentos, né? avaliar a capacidade, então se eu quero contratar um serviço, eu olho antes esse material e vejo se aquilo que está sendo proposto está minimamente parecido com o que está aqui. Eu, eu posso usar também isso aqui para auxiliar o desenvolvimento de competências. Né? E aqui então eu faço um muito obrigado ao Sucre por nos chamar esse grupo para passar por esse desafio tremendo, porque é, eu como professora é, que orientei doutorados e mestrados fui desafiada, muitas vezes desafiada a pensar fora da caixa, a pensar muito longe, a pensar diferente. Com certeza esse grupo aqui fez o mesmo, tá? Recentemente o Bruno se agregou ao, ao grupo para nós então fazermos agora a replicação disso para todos os model users. E então eu agradeço, né? E digo que eu estou aqui como uma uma professora da Universidade Estadual de Campinas, mas eu também estou aqui como um membro do BIM Excellence Organization, né? que é, é uma organização uh, que envolve é, é, uma comunidade de voluntários, né? onde a gente pode se aplicar e a gente pode é, participar de uma forma onde você é estressado, você é estressado para chegar muito mais longe do, do que você imagina e entregar então essa open knowledge, né? participar desse processo de criar open knowledge. E assim eu termino. Vou parar de fazer um share. Vai, Marco, por favor. Obrigado, Regina, pela a é, palestra e é, a explicação muito boas. Eu acho que foi bastante complementar né, ao que o, o Sucre apresentou. Então, acho que realmente vocês aí trabalharam em conjunto. Acho que isso é muito interessante. É, nós temos aqui, no momento, três perguntas. E eu vou fazer aqui as perguntas. Uh, uma é do Sávio, from UFBA, Federal da Bahia. Né, o Suca, ok? What Suca would suggest to Brazilian research who are interested in testing and validate these conceptual foundations? Ok? One question. There are more one. There is more one. Eu vou fazer agora em português. Uh, do Douglas Brito. 
Você já analisou o modelo Light? Poderia se integrar a outros frameworks de implementação do BIM? Esse aí é para a Regina e para o Tsuka. E tem um da Bianca, né? Bianca Vieira. Como dividir os templates para seus respectivos model rules? Model rules. Temos diversas disciplinas, diversos níveis de detalhamento e 76 usos do modelo. Certo? Também é para os dois. Ok? Quem responde? Suka, please. Ok, thank you. Sorry, I missed the first one. Uh, if you don't mind repeating it in English. I, th English? I think he asked uh, how can we Brazilians um, no. uh, interest to invalidate, uh, test and validate the conceptual foundations framework yes yep. but yeah it's, a, it's an open invitation uh, for everyone Brazilians at the of course the forefront but for everyone around the world to look at the, the framework as a framework a skeleton that people could uh, build on top the way it works is the framework provides a base It offers a language through the dictionary. It offers a few templates, a few metrics, and for people to um, contribute by extending the framework. So, okay, so the framework has all these different parts. Uh, one part, for example, is the, the part uh, discussed uh, by Regina, a model use template. What is a model use template? I'm just gonna take just one step back. So what is a model use template when we connect it to the framework, okay? If you remember, we said there is eight milestones. So the first is the intent, the second you define the physical deliverables, the third you define the digital deliverables. When you're defining the digital deliverables, this is where the model use template fits because how do you define digital deliverables? You have to define uh, what models you want, what documents you want, what data sets you need. When you want things to be delivered to you in, as a, a, in a 3D model, that's what we call, and you want to use it as a model, that's called the model use. So the work done by the, by the you know, Gina, Fernanda, the, the team, is to define a template for people to, to define a specific use. So how can you extend? You could work with the, with the F2 team, with, with Regina, Fernanda, And the team um, in order to develop new model use templates for cost estimation, uh, for uh, construction sequencing, uh, for wind studies, solar studies, okay? So you could extend that part. You could also look at metrics, meaning how can we, we have all these reverse uh, actions or so going from one milestone to another. What are the metrics needed? You know, how can we apply some of these metrics? What are the things missing? And we're going to be publishing, uh, we have lots of what's called micro projects related to Project F. So, so, so the framework is like the top micro project. Then we have the model use template is F2, which is the second micro project. Then we have now a project underway, which is called uh, software classification project. So it's, there's a classification of 500 software. That's like a separate project of what, software can do for you with regards to model users, document users, data users. The best thing you can do is read a lot about this. This is not going to show itself directly and it will need some effort. If you find that you would like to contribute on the specific thing in the framework you'd like to improve, like you want to test it in an agile way, test it against lean, test it against IPD, integrated project delivery. You want to test it on a small project within your, like within lab conditions at the moment. We're not recommending it to, to go live. There's a lot of things to make this um, improve, extend, validate it, and hopefully over time becomes a platform. If you were in a company that happy to invest in this, that sees a, 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 a you know, potential for helping the industry move forward, and you want to help the not-for-profit community to develop these platforms, you are welcome. 
you know, you could be part of the discussion, you'd be part of the development. So there's so many things that can be done. Now I'm gonna end with, with just one thing. I wanna, I wanna show you just a quick slide that connects um, what, what Regina was presenting. I'm sorry, let me just show you directly the, this card. Let me see, let's see, look at this one. The framework itself, so connecting information milestones, that's level one flow, okay? There's lots of flows. The flows that uh, Regina showed, like these flows and, you know, are here, level four and level five. We have lots of these flows being developed. And we're now working with partners to connect these information flows to data flows. Because if you want to integrate information across the supply chain, you have to integrate in the data of products, of you know, physical products for construction. The framework allows discussing all these topics without losing the connection. That's what the framework does. So if you are involved in information management, if you, you are a lean expert, if you're an agile expert, if you are any expert within these 76 topics that Regina mentioned, okay, there's a, there's a list of them on the, on, the, on the website. You can go and look for model users list. Please connect with us. Sorry for the long answer, but I, I thought it'd be useful. Uh, I think that the, the template itself, the structure is there. It may be stressed when we apply to other model uses and then we can find that this structure maybe needs uh, updating, changing, but the structure is there. Now it has to be to applied to all model uses and be populated the way we did for the, the, the clash detection, right? Like now for CUST, for structure analysis, for solar analysis, né? all the model, model uses that uh, there are. Uh, how do we go about doing this? Well, after we finished and we were in this uh, throughout this year, thinking about the strategy, the strategy of how to uh, develop new model uses, how to put new model uses in this template, we looked back and looked at our group. How did we come about developing uh, the clash detection, uh, drawing clash detection through this uh, table to this uh, template. So we uh, we draw. Uh, we nós desenhamos a forma com que nós desenvolvemos. We did the, the drawing of how we developed, and now we know this, and we will try to uh, make the new groups go through the process like we did. Or maybe if our process is not applicable to other new templates, things will change. But we will go about managing these new teams, right? To, and it's a big effort, you know. It's a long time effort. Um, Savio also made another question. Savio asked, what Sucre would suggest to Brazilian researchers who are interested in testing and validating the conceptual foundation? I say you should uh, do research in uh, uh, reverse action because we only do research on forward action. We, do, we should do a lot of research in reverse. Uh, we should do research on automation, on robots, put robots to do things, little things, tiny things, big things, you know. I think we should go there. We should understand more about this pool of information, how the information is uh, 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 how the information goes about and, and, and is shared uh, throughout the process, you know. This is, uh, I think we should go through automation. What do you think, Sucre? Yes, I mean, every aspect, uh, you know, needs to be studied more, definitely. Uh, research better than has been done. Uh, this is just the start of, uh, of just, uh, you know, trying to organize knowledge in a certain way to make what we call at the initiative research at scale. 
you know, the idea of the framework is to enable research at scale. Um, how can, it's, it's not no longer enough, and this is just a different concept that we didn't discuss today. The light framework, okay, it's an approach of information management, integration, etc. It's intended to deliver a platform to be used, but also it's intended to encourage research at scale, like a large number of researchers to be working together to solve the problem. Like we see today, sadly, with the COVID-19, one of the good things happening is the openness of sharing data and information with different researchers trying to solve a problem. Of course, our supply chain integration issues is not as serious as COVID-19 or you know, coronavirus, but we have to learn the lessons and we have to work together through open frameworks, open dictionaries, open interaction uh, of sharing knowledge in order to solve this issue of, of, of digital transformation. So please join in finding the area that you are most passionate about and we're looking for researchers and researchers and doesn't mean it have to be academics. It's not what we do and we have 140 people in the, in, in the initiative, uh, half of them only are academics. The rest are researchers, meaning they're searching for a solution. So if you're searching for a solution and the framework fulfills, gives you a structure, please join us. Okay. Uh, temos aqui mais three more questions. Uh, I will try to mix the question because how, at the same, the, it's a Freddy and uh, Mariana. Uh, Existe alguma prioridade em relação aos, aos MU, uh, MU? Porque é, é, um, a, o primeiro demorou um ano para ser uh -huh. é, é, desenvolvido. Né? Com... Não, it, it lasted uh, four months. The, the structure was one year, but the, uh, to apply the structure to the model use was four months. It was all oh, hard work, four months. Ok. And uh, uh, existe alguma forma de otimizar o tempo para se chegar aos 76? Ok? okay. Uh, segunda, segunda, second. Uh, na iniciativa pública, temos muitos desafios. A falta de informação é o principal motivo para a dificuldade de adoção do BIM? Será que existe um modo de uso específico para determinado uso para um perfil de cliente? Seria possível essa tipificação? É. E tem uma, uma terceira questão. Uh, poderia dizer que a, a evolução do BIM conduz a ter um novo produto na indústria da construção, né, é, é, o, o prédio digital em si, ou, ou mais um, um ou, ou see more, uh, could you say that BIM evolution led us to have a new product in building industry? The digital building in, in itself seem more uh, as an individual accept than as Project state toward the physical building. You understand or not? Uh, half. <laughs> uh. Can Can I answer the first question? That's an easy one. <laughs> uh, the first question? Yes. Yes, it's about uh, uh, the the priority of uh, MU. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, 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 Como otimizar esse tempo, né, para que você consiga fazer o 70? Well, we ourselves, the five of us, uh, Lorena, uh, Paula, uh, Bruno, and Fernanda, and me, we had this question. So we did a, a dynamic between us, and we uh, uh, we put a form where we would great the, the 76 model uses we would give four grades of ourselves which we thought was uh, essential uh, we had knowledge about it was essential knowledge 
if it was an innovation, and no, oh, there was a fourth um, criterion, I don't remember. And we would give uh, uh, grades from one to five. And, and with uh, uh, pesos, with, uh, oh, I don't know the word in English. Okay. And so we came with a, uh, with a classification of the 10 uh, model uses which we thought would, we should go about first. But we don't think that we, uh, we should um, enforce this uh, uh, prioritization that we came about because it's a, it's a push and pull uh, thing, opportunity. If there comes a, a group that wants to work with us and has many skills and many uh, competence in four or five uh, uh, model uses, so we, they say, oh, we don't know where to start, then it's oh, okay, you give us the opportunity to tell you. So we look at our lists and say, oh, start with this one, right? Or maybe there comes a group that knows how to do uh, structural calculation very well. It's not on the 10 most uh, prioritized. So yes, yeah, let's go. Let's go for this model use. So it's a push and pull uh, thing about uh, which model use to uh, choose to uh, put on the template. Well, 76, it's a high number, right? We are a group of four. How are we going to go about this? Well, let's go first with baby steps. Let's do a first pilot managing of a new model uh, uh, use described through the template. See how this goes about, see how our, uh, if our I, uh, idea of how we, the process would be replica replicated works. And then uh, we have a, an idea to go uh, parallel more than one uh, model use at a time. And every time a team finishes a model use, we may invite someone to come and join us and do the managing with us. So this group of uh, four or six, five now that manages the future model uses may grow more and more. You learn when you do the, the template to a model use, so you can apply your what you have learned to uh, manage other groups to do other model uses. So this is how we think we should go about. Can I can I can I explain why Regina says working with, with me is difficult? <laughs> it's because we want to finish all remaining model use templates in three years, all of them. Okay, how are you gonna do this? It's because we're applying research at scale principles, meaning. The first one will take, took whatever it took, doesn't matter. It's now tested, validated, published, reduced. The second one would be more than one, would be two or three together to test the mechanisms of delivery with different groups. Then it would be 10 together. Then it would be 20 together, okay? We need to finish this in three years. And this is where uh, the mechanisms took time so, uh, you know, in the, in the background, what you see is you're, you're seeing now the product, but you, there's a strategy, there's a flows, there is, there is, a, there is a, a Gantt chart that developed beautifully by the team about how to recruit, who to recruit, when to recruit, what are the steps for validation. So there's a, you know, I, I, Regina, it's not telling you everything, Regina. Why aren't you telling them everything, Regina? You have such a beautiful mechanism to recruit lots of groups together. Yes. And we're also open to, uh, uh, you know, if, if a company says, I want you to focus on this and I'm happy to help you, we could recruit uh, uh, student researchers, PhD researchers, dedicate certain hours from their time to make this happen quicker, okay? It's about, we want to deliver this openly to the, to the community as soon as possible. We are, we, our role is to develop the mechanisms of delivery, okay? We have the structures for knowledge. Now we're working on mechanisms of delivery, not just for model use templates. We've done this in a dictionary. We've done the dictionary. We have 700 terms. Now has 24 languages, more languages to be added because we're de de delivering mechanisms for, for delivery. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the second and third question. Ah, yeah. about owners. Uh, we don't deal with owners as such or with designers as such. We look at information. So this information could be used by owners, could be used by designers. So look, what is the information gonna be used for? You're gonna be using it for facility management or maintenance. That's what we focus on. So you're gonna be focusing on information uses for operation, for ma maintenance, for management. Yes, an owner could say, oh, these are good for me and you can use them, but anybody else could use them. So we do not differentiate by role. We don't differentiate by phase, like design, construction, and operate. We don't use these uh, differentiations because they're not real. Okay, there's just procurement, uh, you know, uh, you know, historical procurement ways. All types of like uh, information could be used across the whole life cycle. So we focus on delivering the mechanisms, the workflows, the terminology needed to improve uh, these flows. And there was a third question. I'm sorry, I'm missing some of the questions in the chat. So my apologies. Uh, the third question was. Mm. So, uh, it's about your use of uh, the, the the model, the framework, in a public uh, in in a public service. Yeah, I, it could be used by a public service. Uh, you, you know, some of the things uh, being delivered as part of the framework, not just the model use template are uh, for, uh, you know, coupling digital and physical, or what to call a digital twin, you know, some of the things, mechanisms being delivered for that. If you're, uh, if you're, you're uh, in that space, uh, there's something for you. If you are in, in the space of uh, managing uh, uh, specifications for, for assets, yes, that will be part of Milestone 2. So we work there. So across the whole life cycle of the asset, Progressively over the next two to three years, you will find lists for you to use, decision support systems. You will find activity flows similar to what Regina showed, but this will happen progressively. We are working with multiple teams. Each team is focusing on a specific milestone or a specific connection between different milestones. Okay, uh, three last questions, okay, because the, the Good time. Yeah. Uh, existe uma, a professora Diana, da Federal da Bahia. Ela, ela trabalha com drone, IoT e, e inteligência artificial, né, para medições de monitorar progressos em obra, segurança, é, acompanhamento é, físico de recursos dentro da obra. E ela quer saber se, os te se pode ver, haver alguma relação né, é, de, de testar esses modelos nessas aplicações que ela faz. Ok? Ah, uma segunda pergunta, é, qual é a importância desses frameworks para a questão do ensino nas universidades, tanto de engenharia como de arquitetura? Ok? E a última pergunta é, quão importante, não, não desculpa, ah, o modelo usa ah, ranqueamento, rank, com simplicidade, é, é, essencial, inovação e know-how, é, é, critérios de tomada de decisão, não, na verdade, isso foi a, a Lorena dizendo, como eu esqueci os quatro critérios, ah, ela tá. falou que era simplicidade, inovação, qual era o outro? Essencial. É, know-how, o know-how que nós tínhamos, né? E, é e o quão essencial ele era. Aham. Bom, por favor, please. Ok, question first, I'm assuming... Uh, for me and the second I will share with Regina. Uh, uh, whether it's IOD, drones, laser scanning, 3D printing, all these things are, uh, you know, ways of uh, importing and exporting data in uh, from digital to physical. So they are covered in the framework. And when, when it comes to IOT in particular, there is a model use called BIM IOT linking or integration. Okay, so there's that's a specific model use which will benefit from these types of experiences. Now, there's multiple entry points to, to bring in digital information into the asset uh, life cycle. 
uh, through drones. That's an excellent way of, uh, you, know, you know, bringing that through laser scanning. That's another entry point into it. We do not focus on the specific methods in the framework or the work we do. We just accommodate them, meaning whatever the method you use to bring in the data, it should be, you should be able to use the framework for it. Okay, but we don't have currently a specific project that covers the use of drones in construction. That's not something we we'll focus on. Our focus more is on knowledge management, information management and integration, and connecting these to data streams. That's where we focus our attention. We cannot, of course, cover all topics in the industry, but what you mentioned is very important uh, method to bring in information into the life cycle, and then the life cycle will take care of managing it. The second question is about education. I just want to mention before, because Regina, this is Regina's specialty. Everything we do at the BME Initiative is about education. Yeah. Education. It doesn't have to be formal education. We don't have to say we have courses. Okay. We just by providing our you know, uh, knowledge resources openly under Creative Commons, allowing people to use them also within their companies. Uh, you know, um, we want to educate, we want to train, we want people to improve their performance. As we go, we have a project called Project C. If you come to the, to the, to the seminar, we discussed it briefly, we will make some of this educational approaches a little bit more formal, more formal, because what we do is informal education, structured education, we want to make it a little bit more formal. Now, answering uh, Diana, one good way to go would be uh, to, to develop the model use template for integration of BIN IoT, and then instantiate it in, situa in specific situations to test. You know, if the way, if the general way that you describe this model use to integrate BIM and IoT, would uh, uh, be uh, valid when you instantiate because BIN IoT is, um, is very, um, um, let's say, you can do a model use template in a very uh, abstract way. And then when you instantiate, you have to define the, the type of uh, sensors and, uh, um, you know, it's a, uh, there, there may be two, um, levels there but in order education i think that when i was preparing this presentation sukar i looked at the at the flow and i thought here i i see a a, a, a a training prepared you know so you and you you can see uh we in edu education we talk about um, um objectus um Educationize, educational objects. Every uh, of those um, uh, tarefas, of those activities, would be uh, an educational object, a little package, you know, that you can put together mm -hmm. to make a, a big course. So, yes. And I also, I have to tell you that I was um, recently doing a final review of a paper, and I called the, the, the author and I said, Look, you have to read definition of uh, federated model and integrated model in the BIN dictionary because the way you are writing, there is an inconsistency. Please go to the BIN dictionary, understand what is an integrated model and a federated model, decide which one you saw in your case study, and then write about it. So it's already educating, you know, it's already educating. It's uh, educating the terms, you know, to have all the terms in English, then have all the terms in Portuguese, in Turkish, and how many languages are we working on it right now? We have 24 and the Danish should be on soon, so it becomes 25. Yeah, so it's really, you know, open knowledge structuring, open knowledge sharing, so it's, uh, it's all about education. Okay. It's Spanish. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, uh, the discussion, this, the, all this resuming reformation. Uh, Being it's a, it's a, it's a information. 
the pro, uh, the project the drawing as information i think it's a, it's very interesting to to think about and to worry about information because uh, it's a uh, management and uh, project and uh, drawings all work with information in this uh, uh, this framework that they like it's a uh, directly this you know i think it's very very interesting and uh, it's a, a a very very modern it's a very very uh, actual uh, it's a, it's a, it's very very interesting and uh, I, I, I challenge the many people many researchers and uh, for example you know uh, here in fortaleza there is a group uh, innovacom it's uh, one of the supporters of uh, of the the, the the webinar there is a group that study uh, BIM. Uh, it's uh, coordinated by Jefferson Boys, and uh, I think it's a, a, a big problem for this this group to discuss into uh, deep in this uh, in this idea of uh, light, mm -hmm. and because it's a uh, uh, now it's a discuss about BEP, it's about uh, uh, about for example strategic vision about uh, BIM, yes. And uh, uh, it's a, I think it's a, a, a good, a good uh, challenge for this group, and for uh, in Brazil, okay. And, Perfect. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to thanks to Suka, uh, and uh, it's a very very interesting. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to thanks uh, Regina for your uh, presentation. Your for the, the complementary uh, works uh, in the presentation. It's a very, very, uh, uh, very, very interesting for us. Okay. Thank you, so, Professor uh, Basneto for the invitation. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Regina, for, uh, you know, being uh, our colleague in uh, the initiative. You don't know how much value you add and, and your, your, your group, uh, you know, to the to sharing knowledge. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Regina. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's also so nice uh, to be able to share such an open and uh, open view and participate in, a, in an effort that is uh, that wants so big things, you know. So it's always challenging, and I really, it's like uh, I really learn. This process is of learning. Okay, thank you. And Suka, I hope to see you again in Brazil as soon as possible, okay? Absolutely. The, 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 first, the first chance. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'd like Last to... Night. Okay, uh, agradecer a Tatiana uh, e André. André, por favor. Obrigado pela presença de todos, né? E antes da gente encerrar, Barros Neto, eu vou só passar aqui um vídeo do estudo de maturidade que um dos parceiros do evento está desenvolvendo. O estudo okay. de maturidade BIM a nível nacional, tá? Então, eles estão lançando esse estudo, estão fazendo uma, uma campanha bem, é, 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 bem extensa sobre é, esse, esse levantamento de como é que está a maturidade BIM nas, nas empresas, nos escritórios de projetos. Então, eu vou fazer aqui o... Vou abrir aqui o vídeo tá? para quem que estiver participando do evento e quiser apoiar, participar, para que vocês conheçam esse evento. Agora você também faz parte dessa história. O Ciente, com o apoio de grandes especialistas em BIM, traz ao mercado um estudo inédito que traçará um mapa da maturidade de construtoras e incorporadoras para a adoção da metodologia BIM. Meu nome é Gisele Anversa e eu irei te explicar como você construirá essa história conosco. Queremos conversar com construtoras e incorporadoras interessadas na implantação da metodologia BIM. Você pode estar se perguntando, minha empresa ainda não implantou o BIM, então eu não posso participar desse mapeamento? Não se preocupe, você pode e deve participar. Esta pesquisa é para empresas de construção interessadas na metodologia BIM. O projeto é dividido em duas partes. A parte 1 se trata da identificação de empresas interessadas na adoção e implantação da metodologia BIM. A parte 2 é a resposta a um formulário específico. Nós estamos na primeira fase dessa pesquisa. Nesta página, você encontrará o link para realizar a inscrição da sua empresa para a primeira fase. Pedimos que você preencha todos os dados solicitados com muita atenção. 
Essas informações são fundamentais para termos o mapeamento correto de acordo com as características regionais e de cada empresa. Depois disso, você responderá uma pergunta muito importante. Sua empresa utiliza a metodologia BIM? Caso sua empresa trabalhe com a metodologia BIM, você deverá indicar cinco perfis fundamentais para mapearmos a maturidade BIM. Um membro da alta direção, um gerente de engenharia ligado à área de projetos, um analista de engenharia também ligado à área de projetos, um membro da área de tecnologia da informação e um ponto focal da metodologia BIM em sua empresa, um BIM Manager, gerente de projetos ou similar. E não se preocupe se o mesmo profissional em sua empresa desempenhar mais de uma função. Você deve repetir os dados, sem problema. Caso a sua empresa não trabalhe com a metodologia BIM, queremos saber as principais causas que dificultaram ou impediram a adoção da metodologia. Também queremos saber se, no curto prazo, sua empresa considera adotar a metodologia BIM. Lembre-se, estas perguntas encerram a primeira fase, a fase de inscrição das empresas interessadas no mapeamento BIM Brasil. Caso você tenha ficado com alguma dúvida, nós estamos à disposição para te ajudar. E se você gostou desse estudo, nos ajude a impactar o maior número de empresas interessadas. Compartilhe o nosso material e nos ajude a transformar a indústria da construção. Ok, eu vou estar tá encaminhando para os inscritos o, o link da pesquisa. Quem tiver interesse em participar, né, é só preencher como a, a Gisele orientou aí no vídeo. Ok? Então, mais uma vez, eu agradeço, foi um prazer conhecer a professora Regina, né, o Suca, né, Tatiana e Barros Neto, pela parceria que a gente já vem desenvolvendo nesses webinars. Então, foi um prazer, espero que todos tenham, tenham gostado. E mais uma vez agradecer as pessoas que apoiaram a gente, né, as empresas, o Inova Cursindustrial Bahia, a Cone, o Cienge, né, a, a Universidade de Goiás, a UFC, o GECOM. Né. Obrigado, pessoal, e até o nosso próximo webinar. Né, e conto com a participação de todos. Mais uma vez, boa noite e muito obrigado. Bye -bye. Tchau, tchau. Até mais. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.